obviously better than the win threshold percentage, but even if he's not at the win threshold percentage, he's still pretty good. He's still an NHL league average performer at his worst most of the time. The league averages for these two numbers um, for win threshold year to year, it's about 31, 32% to maybe 34, 35% over the course of 10 years that I looked at. Uh, loss threshold percentage is much higher because the margin's slimmer. It's, it's up around 41%. So um, you can see how much better he is than that. It's quite amazing. Uh, this is just another way to look at it, and it also shows the, the, the R squared between the two numbers, which I think is kind of neat. You see some other newer goalies uh, moving up there. I did color it by total starts. You see a goalie like Peter Mrazek. Uh, he's had these long periods where he's gone, you know, 25, 30 games performing amazingly, and then he's dropped off, and then he's come back up, and he's dropped off. Um, but overall, he's looking pretty darn good early in his career. Uh, there's a goalie who didn't get on this, but he performs amazingly well in it, which is um, Hammond on um, Ottawa. I can't figure out why they don't just let him keep playing. Um, yeah, I got five minutes. I got it. <laughs> So, so why am I doing this? Well, like I said earlier, I want to replace uh, wins as a goalie statistic altogether. I just want to get rid of wins from the lexicon of analyzing goalies, and it's going to be impossible because on television, they're grasping for things quickly. I actually don't blame TV analysts when they just kind of throw things out, um, like, hey, he's a winner, he wins a lot of games, he won a Stanley Cup, and all those things, because you got to do things on the fly when you're on TV. I, I've experienced it in doing podcasts. You kind of just say stuff because it's easy to grasp onto. Um, but I would love to replace that lexicon and talk more about the impact on winning that a goalie has. That's what I want to talk about. Um, and, and you know, also I want I want to look at potentially replacing this quality start uh, st the statistic. So with all due respect to Rob Volman, I, I think that that's just a flawed stat and it is tossed around in analytics communities. Well, Quality starts really doesn't consider the quality of the shots being faced or the quality of performance. It's really just the threshold of goals given up. Um, so I want to look at potentially replacing that as well. And then I want to look at what I said before, which is the consistency versus boom or bust. Um, you know, just quickly going back, you've got a goalie down at the bottom there, uh, Kari Ramo, who does not perform well in win threshold percentage, but he also doesn't kill you a lot of the time. So maybe there's a place for him. Um, obviously, as opposed to some of these guys in red. Okay, so I'm actually going to skip this stuff. I did it in, like, I don't know if I was blacked out or something, but it's a really bad idea. But I'm just going to explain it very, very quickly. <laughs> okay, so I got bored uh, this week, and I was like, I want to look at something else really quickly. So I decided to look at... I decided to look at goalies' impact on their most common defensemen, uh, their, their goals against per 60. Goal-based analysis of goalies and defensemen is just really not a good idea. I'm not into with or without use, but I did it anyways because I don't know. And um, so what I looked at was uh, goalies that have appeared over since 2007 for uh, 10,000 minutes or more, and defensemen who have played with them for uh, a thousand minutes and play without them for at least a thousand minutes. Um, I wanted to find, uh, this was the Randy Moss thing, so going back to the Randy Moss thing quickly, I wanted to see if there were other players like Randy Moss. So what Randy Moss, if you know anything about him and that impact thing, he has made like seven of the nine quarterbacks he played with, he made them have their career years when he played with them. And then they fell off, like Jeff George and guys like that. So it's pretty amazing. So I, I just wanted to see if there were guys like that. Um, so, yeah, there are. It's Henrik Lundqvist. <laughs> um, so, Henrik, so it's colored in red, and the reason it's colored in red, that's to show you uh, the goals against per 60 of the, of the defensemen, the 15 defensemen that he played with that met that threshold. Um, their their goals, against, uh, goals against per 60 without him, and it's 2.6. It's really bad. That's five on five. Uh, it's incredibly bad. So with him, 100% of those defensemen improved on that performance, and they improved by um, 0.4 goals against per 60, 
which is absolutely insane. So just in wrapping up, basically what that means is that uh, I was right all along, the Rangers defensemen stink, <laughs> and we need to save them, we need to do anything we can to fix this problem. That's it. <laughs> I, <laughs> thank you very much. I just wanna thank, uh, um, I mentioned RDJ earlier. Um, if you can scribble down his blog, I, I think it's really good. He's only got a couple articles on there, but I kinda wanna you know, give him some incentive to, to write more, because I think he's smart, he questioned my work, and, and made me think about things differently. And then obviously I took some stats from Corsica and Emmanuel Perry and from uh, Hockey Analysis. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is going to be a dual presentation. Uh, Matt Kane's going to follow me. Uh, I'm going to start. My name is Ryan Stimson. I figured I'd just introduce myself here. Since for those that don't know, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, uh, I was really big into soccer and soccer analytics and the numbers and things you could look at in soccer. And so a number of years ago, I decided that it would be great to have some passing data available at the NHL level. And since nobody did, I decided, well, let's just start tracking this and see how things go. And You know, it's uh, really kind of taken off over the years. I've been in a couple of these, and there's a number of people uh, that share the enthusiasm to do a lot of work for free and uh, join me in tracking a lot of data. So uh, I'll specify exactly how many games and teams we're dealing with as we get into some of these numbers, but uh, since 2013, 2014, uh, we have tracked uh, close to or just over a thousand games. Uh, so there's a lot, you know, a lot of this is still the exploratory analysis level, but there's a lot that we can get into, much like the research on zone entries and zone exits, and uh, see what research kind of takes us. So first off, what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna define, define some terms we're gonna use. Uh, when I say shots, I'm strictly speaking all shot attempts. Okay, so when you see shots, I know Micah agrees with me and a few others. Um, that's what we're talking about here. So uh, shot assists is essentially, essentially shots that are preceded by a pass from a teammate. Uh, so what we're looking at here, uh, these top four metrics are based on the 20 teams that we have at least 30 games of data on going back to 2013, 2014. Uh, and anytime you're working with new data, you know, what you want to do is you want to first measure it to find out if you're uh, you know, measuring something of, of importance, of skill, or if what you're looking at is certainly random. Uh, and certainly there's a lot, you know, even the data we track that is simply happenstance that is random. So we want to focus on that that's statistically uh, significant. And the nice thing about, you know, presenting at some of these conferences and meeting smart people online is that uh, you can always, you know, ask their assistance with the best way to go about these things. So uh, what we're looking at here is the split half uh, repeatability for shot assists, shots against the expected goals against metric via Corsica, and uh, another one of our metric entry assists uh, for the sample size. And a split half test very quickly is just simply looking at the data in the even uh, odd or the even games in your sample and looking at how it predicts what happens in the odd games in the sample. So uh, what we quickly establish is that how teams defend against passes. Uh, you know, again, within this exploratory sample, uh, appears to be quite repeatable. Uh, you know, lots of shots, you know, come off, uh, you know, caroms, they come off deflections, they come off bounces, but how teams allow others to set up, how they allow them to transition, uh, things like that, uh, you know, that lends itself some credence with, with some of these numbers uh, that would be more system or skill-driven based. Uh, 
And then the third column over there is just talking about how those same metrics predict uh, the, uh, the goals against ratios uh, and the odd number of gains using that data from the even numbered sets. Uh, and based on our work, again, we tracked you know, several tens and thousands of shots. Uh, you know, teams do shoot at a higher percentage from shot assisted shots than just all shots in general, or in fact, those that are not assisted by pass. Uh, and then this year we added in uh, so much more detailed tracking. Those are the bottom three metrics here. These are based on uh, the 13 teams this season that you know, we tracked at least 30 games on. And I've written about some of these particular uh, before and others have, but looking at uh, behind the net shot assists, this is where, you know, if you've ever watched Joe Thornton play, you know, he makes a living through doing this. Um, it's where the final pass preceding a shot comes from behind the net. The Royal Road is a term made popular by Steve Valquette uh, a year or two ago now. Uh, it's the imaginary line between the goal and the top of the faceoff circle. You can see some repeatability there at the team level, but uh, not as much productivity as, as you'd like to see considering there are such high quality chances. It may just be to the uh, lower rate of frequency of these events in games. Uh, and then the bottom one is something, again, brand new we started doing this year, but just we split the ice up into three different lanes, focusing it. Uh, between the face-off dots and outside the face-off dots, looking at you know, what you can uh, predict based on where the pass comes from. Um, what we found is that teams giving up a lot of chances in front of their own net um, you know, obviously makes sense, but uh, you know, not just from in close, this is just strictly if you allow teams to, you know, to distribute and pass the puck on the center lane. So now we're going to look at uh, these metrics. This is, uh, you know, the visualization panel this morning didn't talk about Excel bar charts, so uh, I'm going to do that for them. <laughs> very, very simple and easy uh, direct way just to get across what I'm talking about. But uh, these are the shot assist rates at 5-on-5 five five for the teams. Uh, every team from last season, we have at least 21 games on every team. Um, what we see quickly are, you know, oriented from left to right, are the team best at suppressing these chances. You see Florida, you see Carolina, you see LA. Uh, and then if you go over to the right, you see Arizona, Calgary, and Colorado, everyone's favorite defensive team. Uh, moving quickly to uh, the entry assists. Uh, again, these are simply you know, variation on controlled entries. These are just the uh, passes in transition we record at which the end of the sequence results in a shot. Uh, again, you see Florida up at the top. You see Columbus, New Jersey, Carolina again. So there's some repetition with teams that are up there, but uh, if you look at the previous slide, you see LA drops from the third best team to somewhere hammered or sandwiched between uh, Edmonton and Nashville towards the uh, top of the bottom third of the league. So again, some of this data allows you to focus in on various aspects of a team's game defensively and what, you know, where they may lack. So for the rest of this presentation, basically what I did is I went and looked at very closely at some games uh, that we had tracked with Florida and Colorado. And if you read some of my recent work, you know it's it's about using our data uh, with you know video evidence to try to you know uh, articulate what we're seeing in the data and how this can be used to inform uh, tactical decisions made by teams. So. Um, what uh, what game we're going to look at here is a uh, Florida's. Uh, April Lamp game versus Carolina. Uh, Florida's style in this game is very, very aggressive. We're going to get into that in the clips here and how it contrasts with, uh, with Carolina. So I'm going to get into these quickly here because I want to make sure Matt has enough time. But uh, the opposite of that for uh, Colorado um, was a much more passive, much more retreating style. Uh, so we're going to get into that real quickly here and then Matt's going to take over. So this is just a quick look at uh, uh, the half ice overload in your defensive zone that Florida employed for a good portion of this game. Uh, you notice, you know, three forwards close on the boards, you know, supporting each other. Um, it's very much a, you know, the puck comes into your zone. Uh, you can, you know, assist, you know, your teammate in defending there. You have the defenseman um, and defend or one defender and a third forward high in the zone there defending the slot. We're going to take a look at that in action. Uh, at least we should be able to. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So, um, what you see. Is essentially by doing this, you're essentially shrinking the space that your your opponent has to work with. Um, so what you see is you see uh, you know, Carolina is doing themselves no favors by 
playing on the same side of the ice that Florida wants to defend. It was offering no cross ice threat to try to relieve the pressure. Uh, you see there was very little room. Florida's able to squeeze the play, get it out of the zone very well. Contrast that with Colorado. You see Colorado will, you know, they fail to get out of the zone here. Um, puck comes back down. There's a lot of helter skelter chasing. Very easy to get two on ones against Colorado's defense, losing people in coverage. Not nearly the same amount of pressure that they offer. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples of how terrible Colorado was. <laughs> You'll see Nashville climbs high in the zone and exchanges here with Yossi. Everyone else follows the puck going up and it's uh, incredibly easy two on one play at the net. Um, important thing here is watch Eric Johnson, uh, USA Olympian, uh, right there in the center. Um, you know, really guarding no one except for a plot of open space. Um, again, you know, one of the things that makes Nashville and, and teams in general, and we'll get into this a little bit, is you know the ability and free flowing nature to switch your positions among your teams uh, and your players. So this is a after a face off. We're going to show two different styles here. Face off in the off tip is out. Excuse me, offensive zone. Carolina wins it. Florida attacks right away. Pressure leads to an easy dump out, easy change of possession. Colorado does not do that. Uh, the puck, uh, here we go. Okay, so St. Louis wins the draw. I mean, that's that's like perfect quarterback, you know, pocket protection in the NFL there when they uh, break out. That's uh, it's a clean exit, clean entry. Petrangelo activates. They lose Steen again in the space. He vacates, creates an easy chance. One more time, real quick. See, there's no pressure, and what we're going to get into here in transition is uh, Colorado's players are just backing off, backing way off again. It's a retreating style. And we're going to contrast that with Florida here. Just about two more of these. See if I can stop. Yeah, okay. So I can stop this. And now you see how aggressive Florida's defensemen are. Um, you know, they almost have five people in the zone. You know, Carolina tries to pick out here, but uh, the aggressive nature, the, the tight gaps, the, the uh, pinching here. Leads to a quick turnover at center ice, and now you get the opponent going the other way very quickly. Results in a great chance going the other way. Here's one more from Florida, how uh, very active and uh, puck comes over and it triggers the other four checker to come in. Puck goes back, triggers the other one to come up. So they try to get it out here. This is a Jakob Pino defenseman that steps up here, uh, cuts off you know, the outlet. He comes in, he's allows for a chance there, and he's allowed that freedom to do that because the forward, Teddy Purcell, will then go back and cover for him in the point in their transition D. So again, this idea of position switching and free-flowing aggression, if you're going to be aggressive in one area of the ice, uh, you need to continue that aggression all throughout and flexibility within your lineup, otherwise you're going to lead to some holes. So here's Colorado's transition defense. This is the last clip. So we have a failed pass here. Again, the uh, Comes through again, very retreating, very passive, no challenge. Or right, they're able to come down and get an easy, uh, easy chance there. So what? So uh, again, what I talked about in some of the articles I've been uh, working on this summer is, you know, we can use our data to uh, perhaps improve some existing metrics or get it better ideas to analyze and evaluate how teams defend. Uh, and then when you see teams show up well in the numbers, you you're obligated at that point to go to the video to look closely to try to look for traits, uh, what teams are doing, what players are doing, uh, because it's, you know, we can use numbers great for player evaluation and acquisition, uh, but at the same time, how can we use data to then optimize our current lineup, our roster, our tactical decisions? Uh, so again, the next step is, uh, you know, using this data, the numbers to quantify data-driven ways to how we can approach the game tactically. Uh, really it's kind of like an ambitious project but looking at you know taking out different decisions and tactical decisions from other teams can we develop a sort of you know data-driven hockey system that statistically would be uh, an ideal way to approach how to play the game last slide this is everybody that has tracked some games this season I believe some of you are here uh, I think Kristen's here Chris is here. Krista, why don't you stand up? Everyone give Krista a round of applause for all the yeah. 
And if anybody else is, I just know Krista registered, so I'm not sure if anybody else is. But uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, it's a lot of work, it leads to a lot of, of cool things like this. So Matt's going to come up and continue this at the player level. Yeah, you can all applaud now if you like. Okay. Awesome. Uh, as Ryan said, my name is Matt Kane. I'm a writer for Hockey Drafts, and I also publish some of my work on my own website, which is hotplusplus.com. I'm on Twitter at Kane underscore Matt if you want to know my, my really bad opinions. Um, and today I'm going to be talking, uh, taking the flip side of what Ryan presented, I'm going to be looking at individual defensive play and how we can use the passing project data to evaluate um, players at the player level, uh, their defensive skills. So I want to start by talking about why it's so hard currently to evaluate individual defensive play. And really what it comes down to is if you think about it, defensive results are the product of a whole bunch of things going on for the team all at once. So for one player to have a significant impact can be somewhat difficult. Players have to act as a team. There are five people who all need to be doing their jobs in order to prevent bad things from happening. If one player doesn't back check, uh, or if one player gets caught out of position, you can really skew the stats uh, for the unit as a whole. So your results in general, general are gonna be heavily influenced by your teammates to begin with. Um, player matchups can also have a, uh, can have a, have a significant impact on results. So, if you're playing against the top forwards, we know that offensively, um, offensive skills are very repeatable. So if you're consistently playing against the top players, that's gonna disadvantage you from a defensive point of view. And lastly, defensive systems can obviously have uh, quite a large impact on the results that we observe. I think you can just look at uh, how much the Leafs defensive results change going from Randy Carlisle to, Matt, uh, to Mike Babcock for an example of why defensive systems actually matter and how they can influence your results. The other side of it is that defensively, we really don't have a lot of granular data from what the NHL provides us right now. We have shot attempts, we have shot locations that we can throw in to, to create expected goal metrics, but we don't have the same level of information that we have offensively. So offensively, we know who took the shot on goals, we know uh, who assisted on the shot, who assisted on goals. Uh, with the passing project data, we can even get the last three passers. So we have a lot more information about who specifically was, was involved in every offensive play. Defensively, we don't know uh, whether a player was out of position. We don't know if someone wasn't back checking. We don't know if someone lost their coverage in the defensive zone. We simply can't attribute uh, actions to any one individual player with the data that we have now. Fortunately, with the passing project data, we get a lot more granularity. We have a lot more information about how plays are being sequenced, uh, what areas of the ice plays, plays are occurring on, and we can use that information to start to make more, uh, more intelligent guesses about who's actually good at playing defense and, and what skills are important for defenders. And the, the last point I, I had to throw in here is that the goalies are voodoo and, and hate statistical analysts. Uh, so for, for evaluating defensive results in particular, it's really hard to predict which players are gonna allow the most goals because goalies throw a huge wrench in that. A goalie who plays bad uh, for you for all of your shifts, you know, that's gonna really negatively impact the amount of goals that you, you allow. And we all know that, you know, on ice save percentage, really not a repeatable, not a metric that we can trust at all. So, uh, what type of passes are we interested in? I think Ryan talked about a lot of these, so I'm not gonna go into definitions in too much detail, but I put together five metrics that I think provide a good overview of how players can impact the game defensively. So entry assists against for 60, obviously Eric Telski and the whole zone entry project has really emphasized the importance of gaining the zone with control, uh, or in our case, preventing access to the zone, uh, to the offensive zone with control. Um, entries against for 60 is really going to help us evaluate which players are number one, good at those skills that lead to, to preventing zone entries. So things like gap control, staying, staying in position, not allowing odd man rushes, but also when you do allow a controlled entry, 
who's who's maybe better at at uh, staying in position, keeping the player to the outside so they don't allow shot attempts against. Uh, center lane shots against. I think you know the first thing you're taught defensively is is take away the middle of the ice, force players to the outside. Everyone from the second you lace up your skates, you learn that. Obviously, if you're allowing a lot of passes in the center of the ice in the offensive zone, you're not doing a very good job of that. So this is a metric that we would think at least uh, individual players should have some ability to impact if they're taking away the center of the ice, if they really are good at staying in formation, forcing players to the outside. Uh, behind the net uh, passes leading to shot attempts. Again, this, this metric in particular is an area where I think we, we would expect to see defensemen having a fairly significant impact. This is really where your traditional shutdown defenseman is going to make their marks because this metric is going to measure uh, how well players are able to win puck battles in the corner, maintain their positioning, prevent, uh, prevent the opposing forwards from getting loose and, and making a dangerous pass to the center of the ice. Uh, Royal Road shot attempts, why is this important? Uh, you can really just look at the shooting percentage uh, from our data. These are really dangerous shots. And obviously you want to prevent really dangerous shots from occurring. Uh, and the last, uh, the last one I want to add on is point shots against per 60. Ryan didn't talk about this, but point shots actually have a, have a uh, really low shooting percentage. So we, we're interested in which players um, maybe are good at forcing the puck to the outside. And, and if a higher percentage of their, uh, of their shots against are coming from the point, then we want to give them more credit than perhaps their, their traditional shot metrics would give them. So I'm going to start with defensemen and look at What's repeatable? What do we think of our skills? Uh, I ran the same sort of split half correlation that, that Ryan did in his, uh, in his presentation on the defensive stats for defensemen for each of these metrics. And I presented shot assists against as a, as a comparison there. So really what we're looking for is any metric that has a high correlation says to us that with the data in one half, we can make a strong prediction about what's going on in the data. And that is really the key for us to have any trust in the metric. If we can't use the data in one half to predict the other half, then we can't really place any weight on a player's results. We don't know if the players who are really good in one half are going to be the same players who are really good in the other half. And therefore, you know, there's a lot of luck. It may be offensive contributions that are causing these, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of randomness for a metric with a low repeatability. So which metrics for defensemen seem to be the most repeatable? Well, there are three that, that really stood out for defensemen. The first is entry assist against for 60. Um, so this is in line with what Eric and Eric Tulski and, and a lot of other people have found. Um, gaining the zone with control or preventing access to zone with control is really important and also repeatable on this end in, in preventing shot attempts. Um, center lane passes, again, in line with Ryan's results. Defensemen need to control the middle of the ice, and they, they clearly have the ability to control the middle of the ice, which we see in the, in the relatively high split half repeatability. And lastly, like we hypothesized, behind the net shot attempts per 60. Um, defensemen need to control the area. They need to win those puck battles. That's the way they can influence that. We see a fairly high repeatability there, which means that they are having an impact that's measurable with the passing data that we've collected. Uh, on the other hand, the, the interesting result that you see there is, in contrast to the teams, there's really no repeatability uh, for Royal Road shot attempts. So, so part of that is that they're just really rare events. But what that means is that the players who are giving up a lot of Royal Road shot attempts against, they're not necessarily the players who are going to give up a lot in the future. So we don't necessarily want to place a lot of weight on that metric when we're evaluating defenders. It seems to be a lot of noise, a lot of randomness there. So one question you might have is, are all these skills related? So we know that preventing entries is a skill. We know that winning puck battles in the corner is a skill. We know that protecting the middle of the ice is a skill. Are these different skills or are they all related? We'd like to think at least that they should all be somewhat related uh, because playing defense in general should be a, a broad set of skills. But what we want to ask ourselves is, are the players who are the very best at, let's say, preventing entries also the very best at playing in the corners? And if we look at the correlations, we see that, yes, the, the in general, defensive skills tend to carry over, but it's not a perfect correlation. So there are going to be players who are really good at winning those puck battles in the corner and preventing the shots on passes from behind the net. But those aren't necessarily going to be the same players who are best at preventing, let's say, zone entries against. 
And so this has some interesting implications from both a team building and a strategy point of view. First off, from a team building point of view, it means that you have to build a team that is able to defend against both sides of it. You don't want to leave your squad with an obvious gap where you've got no players who can defend against the behind the net pass and you get run over by a team with you know, big power forwards who can win those tough battles in the corner. Similarly, if you're a coach trying to figure out how to deploy their lineup, you can maybe look at the, the defensive passing statistics to decide who you want to start in the defensive zone versus the offensive zone. You likely want to start your defenders who are good at protecting against uh, zone entries in the offensive zone, whereas the players who are good at protecting against the, the behind the net pass should be starting in the defensive zone. So there's a few different ways that you can use this data to identify players with different playing styles who might be suited to different situations or different clubs. So, an example. I randomly selected two defenders. <laughs> it's just really lucky. Yeah. Um, two players who, who happen to be traded for each other. Um, one with a fairly strong defensive pedigree. Uh, someone who player who I think most scouts and analysts would say is is one of the tougher players to play against defensively. You don't want to go into the corner against him. Uh, and then P.K. Subban, who, who might have a reputation as a less defensively able player. Um, I'm not saying that people think that, but I've seen it written a lot. Um, so I wanted to compare how they look by these three metrics that we've identified as defensive skills. So I presented two sets of stats here, their, their raw rate stats and also the relative stats to get a sense as to how they compare to their teammates. And when we look at the data, we see that by both the rate stats and the rel stats, they're really not that different of players defensively. P.K. Subban uh, looks a little bit worse by the, rel by the relative stats um, on entry assist at least, but for center lane shots, protecting the middle of the ice, and playing in the corner in particular, which is really like what a lot of people emphasize is Shea Weber's strength. You don't want to go into the corner with them. The results that they get are basically the same uh, relative to their teammates. And so the implication of all this is that maybe the narrative that P.K. Subban is a terrible defender and that the Canadians really beefed up their blue line isn't necessarily true. Obviously, small sample size alert, like we're only looking at about 20 games for each of these players, but the initial findings do suggest that maybe there's, maybe there's he's not as much of a defensive liability as people would think. So moving on, on the other side of the ice, forwards, do they even matter on defense? <laughs> Uh, I ran the same test, the same split half correlations. I'm not going to go into too much detail about each of the metrics, uh, but the things you want to observe are number one, there's a lot lower repeatability. We would kind of expect this. Forwards are going to have less of an impact on defense than defensemen, where the title is in the name. Um, they have the biggest influence on, on the number of entry assists against for 60. So that means that unfortunately you do have to listen to your coach and back check. Um, and they have some impact on center lane shots. Again, this makes sense. Forwards do play a role in clogging up the middle of the ice, preventing, preventing you know, players from getting to those high danger areas and forcing them to the outside. And my last example is the Buffalo Sabres forwards uh, from the last year. I looked at the two metrics that I sort of identified as the, the more repeatable metrics, the, the entry assist against and the center lane shot against. Um, this is all the Sabres forwards. I hope there are Sabres fans here. I kind of assumed there would be, but. Maybe not. Maybe they don't want to identify themselves. Um, uh, and, and the two things I took away from this are that noted two-way cent center, Ryan O'Reilly had the most entry assists against for 60, and noted defensive liability, Evander Kane had the fewest entry assists against for 60. Take what you want from that, small sample size alert. Um, but that's all I have. Obviously, a lot of this we're working with, with fairly small samples, and as we get more data, we need to verify these results. But there's a lot of interesting things here, and it's really clear to me that this passing data can help us identify different playing styles defensively um, that can be useful in both from a coaching point of view and from an managerial point of view. And that's all I have. Okay, so we know we're uh Running a little over, we're going to do a short uh, Q&A session with uh, John, Nick, if you guys want to come back down. Probably do like about 10 minutes, and uh, then we will move right into the coaching panel. 
Uh, I know we're probably about 10 minutes behind. It'll be about 20 when we get that started, but uh, we'll make it up a little later. We're good. So. question for John. Um, at one point you had a slide up there where you said um, you had some stats and you were talking about time kill and then later just below that you had some stuff about time defended and I missed, must have missed the distinction between those two. Could you just clarify that? Absolutely. So time kill is is the time spent in the doubles case that the penalty kill spent outside of their zone. So whatever time the opposition power play couldn't attack. Time defended is the inverse of that. So for example, if the Devils killed 40 seconds of a two minute power play, your time killed is 40 seconds, and your time defended is, thank you, a minute 20. I, I really forgot basic math for a moment. Uh, but no, it is the inverse of, uh, the, of the time killed. So how much time you spent in your own end of the ring. So this is for Matt, I guess, but like a few slides back, both PK and Weber both looked bad in all of the stats, because I would assume a negative number is good. Is that right or am I reading it wrong? Uh, yeah, for the, for the relative stats, they were relatively worse than their teammates. One thing to keep in mind with those is that they could be heavily influenced, I guess, in this case by zone starts, particularly for Weber, who I think at least last year was, was used pretty heavily in the defensive zone to start. Um, and also one, one other thing to add to that is the, uh, you know, again, since we're, we're still working toward collecting a full season of data, so, you know, the 20, 30 games that we have on a team, it could come against, you know, powerhouses team you know, versus uh, smaller ones. So things like zone starts, quality competition are gonna impact those numbers on a smaller scale. So we're, we're, we're still working to flesh out the, the full season. Agreed. Uh, this, is, this is a question for Nick. You started your presentation with a chart showing uh, say percentages between starters and backups for the same team. Um, did you run the same, did you make a, a similar chart for your new win threshold and loss threshold stats, have, and what did you find? I have not yet, if you would like to, <laughs> you're more than welcome to. Yeah, that, so um, I've, done, I've done some stuff in the past with that, with adjusted goal save above average. I haven't done it with Manny Perry's um, expected goals, but I assume those two stats line up very similarly, so I assume, I assume you'd see some of the same, or whatever you want to call it, team effect in those stats as well. Um, with that being said, we are getting more granular detail out of those progressively. You know, with adjusted goal saves above average, we're, we're getting um, basically shot distance or pinned uh, danger zones. With the expected goals, we're getting even more information with the shot type, rebound, uh, uh, angle, uh, all those sorts of things uh, in play as well. So I think we're starting to tease out and uh, at least account for um, some of those 
variables that were maybe underaccounted for with, with past time. Okay. I, I have a quick question for, I guess, Wolf Nick and uh, Matt and Ryan. So, or it's really more of a comment. So I, I think you, you guys should really consider using a, so you propose these metrics for judging defense and judging goalies. I, I think one way that you can kind of judge their effectiveness is if you built a logistic regression model and try to see, okay, out of all these measurements, like which ones actually effectively predict a win. So, you know, does, have, does a goalie with a high win threshold generally mean that the team is gonna win you know, more often than not. Yeah, I, well, and, and you, I mean, you could even do it in a simple way by just comparing with threshold to actual wins um, as a starting point. But yeah, you're right. And I think that's probably the next step. So, you know, last year when I presented adjusted goal saved above average for 60, some people then went out and said, well, okay, is that predictive of anything? And they started looking into it and they're like, eh, not really, um, which was good. That's what, I want to happen, so I think that's that. You know, it's kind of the next step. Yeah, and I think we're talking about like predicting wins. I'm gonna steal and probably butcher a quote that Sam made at the uh, DC conference a little over a year ago when we talked about uh, reducing wins to currency of goals. Uh, I think I had that right, Sam. So I apologize if it's wrong. Um, and that if we can identify things that you know help give us a better idea of what to expect in terms of the goals we allow. You know, the winds are naturally going to flow from that. Okay, I think we're going to do two more questions. So this is for uh, Matt and Ryan. Um, I was wondering if you guys, kind of tying this back to uh, what Ryan was saying in the beginning about kind of it being a trusted passing piece of soccer, if you looked at um, number of passes before kind of danger incidences. And what I'm thinking here is that everything we've got is kind of based off of one pass. Was the pass into the slot? Was it to a given area? And would there be any kind of usefulness in saying, well, you know, shots generated after three completed passes versus two completed passes, you know, versus coming from outside the neutral zone into the offensive end, pass completed in the offensive end, like a series of passes instead of isolating on one individual thing. Just right. as a high level hypothesis, I would guess that yeah, as you find in soccer, multiple completed passes need a better shot percentage. But that's just my initial hypothesis. No, you're actually right. We actually do track the final three passes prior to a shot. Um, and you see shooting percentage typically rise based on the number of chances, the number of passes before uh, the shot is actually taken, suggesting that, you know, if you're moving the puck at will and linking up correctly, whether it's in, tr in transition or in the zone, you know, you're not giving the team time to set, the goalie's moving. So you do see, you know, goal scoring tick up a few percentage points. Again. So you're exactly right. Uh, this question is for uh, Nick. Um, I noticed on the final um, graphic you put up about comparing goalies and defensemen they often play with, that um, one of the goalies relatively close to Lundqvist was um, Pecorine, who's kind of become a buzzword of a goalie lately. About so this, is, this is why this was such a bad idea. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I'm curious. Um, the Predators are usually regarded as a good shot suppression team, and he's usually regarded as a goalie that needs shots to basically be good. Um, what exactly is, is there any like grounds or quantitative data to express that, or, or like what exactly is your take on, on his position in the organization? So I guess from, okay, so from a general standpoint, just not tech arena, but generally there's, no correlation between volume and performance, but on a case-by-case -case basis, I think there is. I don't know, I, I feel like somebody has looked into Pecorine and found that that's not actually not true with him. Um, but with that being said, um, yeah, he's an interesting case. He has made all of his defensemen that he commonly played with who have had adequate time without him as well, he's made them all better. Um, over the course of his career, but you gotta remember he's had a long career and it's only been the past three years, or well, two years really, where he's become a lightning rod uh, as far as performing, you know, pretty poorly. And it's all post-injury. So, you know, that it kind of goes back to goalie shelf life and things like that. I think a lot of his boost came earlier in his career and he's just played with those defensemen for a long time. Okay, so actually we're gonna, we're gonna end it right there, if we can move right into the, 
the coaching panel we have lined up next. Uh, the coaches in the room want to come on down. Thank you, all those teachers. Okay, so now we're gonna move, you know, away from the uh, the spreadsheets and the, the models and everything. We're gonna talk, uh, you know, through the lens of coaching and how we can use data to, uh, you know, enhance our on ice decisions or roster makeup and uh, things of that nature. So, uh, they all on? We good? Okay. All right. So uh, I guess what we'll do, uh, Mike, if you want to start, and we'll just go down the line. You guys can introduce yourself, your program. Uh, talk a little bit about you know just your exposure to analytics and data and just your opinion on it. I promise you guys want to solve this. If, uh, you know. All right, my name is Mike Germain. I'm an assistant coach with the RIT men's hockey team. Um, first off, uh, my opening comments from Wayne, our head coach, and Brian, our assistant, our associate head coach. Uh, they're both out recruiting right now, but uh, they do want to thank. Uh, Ryan and Matt and everyone who's helped them with the uh, statistics and the analytics that we've had this year. Um, it certainly has verified a lot of information that uh, we look at on a daily basis and somewhat dispelled some of the information that we look at on a daily basis. Uh, being Wayne and Brian being traditionalists in hockey, um, they've always thought of one particular way uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have 10 objectives that we want to get through, or at least meet each game. And typically, if we get 80% of those objectives, uh, we have a really good chance of winning that game. And one of them was how many hits, uh, how, how physical were we throughout that game. And what we found out through our the different numbers that Ryan and Matt were giving us were, well, if we had a higher puck possession time, how can we throw more hits than the other team? Um, so that was one thing that we looked at and we're like, wait a minute, we've been thinking about this all along. We want the puck. We don't want to be chasing. Um, so we looked at that as maybe as an objective that we might not want to put a lot of weight on. Uh, so it was just an example of how uh, the information helped us look at what we're looking at a little bit differently. Um, Ryan, I just didn't know you had it in for the avalanche the way you did, but uh, I listened to, <laughs> I listened to uh, an interview with Patrick Roy, and uh, maybe they're just not saying why he really resigned. Maybe it was you. I don't know if you had a conversation with him or not. Or sent them that video with a little bit of a narrative with it, right? Um, but for me, one of my responsibilities is the goaltender. So, you know, Nick, you're over here trying to figure out goalies. I've was a goalie. I've been a goalie coach here for 11 years, and uh, most of it, not, not most of it, but some of it is a, I become a psychologist at times. I grab a couple of Gatorades and I sit down with the goalie after a tough game, and you know we go through life. You know we don't just go through hockey. Um, we go through a whole, whole slew of things. Um, but one of the things that uh, areas that I felt were more important than your traditional save percentage or even your goals against was. Uh, I take, you know, when they call it the home plate, so you draw a line from the goal post to the face-off dot up to the top of the circles, you got your home plate there. Um, and I look at the save percentage inside of there. 
You know, for me, I expect our goaltenders to make the saves from the outside. If they're not, then I'm not worried about the home plate because we've got more problems than, than uh, giving up quality chances. So I, for this past year, I took all the quality chances that we gave up in that home play area, and that was our save percentage that we looked at. Um, and right now, I don't think we have a big enough sample to really give you an idea of what it should be. But uh, if we had an 80% save percentage inside of that home play area, uh, we won most of those games. Um, and then the second thing that I really like looking at uh, that I put a lot of weight on was those shots that we do give up from the outside. Uh, our goaltenders, are we, are we making the correct save? And what I mean by that is, are we turning that outside shot or that non-threatening shot into a second chance opportunity for the other team? Uh, so we kept track of that. And obviously, the more often that we did that, uh, the more chances, the more chances the team didn't have against. And uh, it showed that our goaltenders were playing well and we're into the game. And uh, one of the questions from one of the one of the people here was about volume and a goaltender's performance. And I will tell you that any goalie will tell you that if they get some, if they get work, they will be into the game and play better most of the time. Um, <laughs> you're never going to say always with a goalie. They're the unicorn, abominable snowman, whatever you want to call them, um, voodoo, black magic. Um, it doesn't matter. They're just. There is no rhyme or reason. The best thing that we can do is get as consistent as we possibly can with goaltending. And I'll go more into some of the things that we did this past year, but that was my opening stuff. Hi. Yeah. Hi, my name is Joe Cardarelli. I'm the head coach at Cortland State. I'm starting my third year there, so um, we've been a very good program, and we we certainly try to figure out what are we doing and how's it working. So uh, we try to use statistical analysis on most everything that that we do. One of the big things I read in a book somewhere that scoring more goals in the opposition leads to wins. So. <laughs> One of the first things that we did was place value on every potential scoring chance, for and against, by player. And seeing who's making the most of their opportunities, who's, um, who's getting the most, who's giving up the most, and trying to place more value on who's, uh, who's effective. We have limited opportunities and, uh, well, budget constraints, time constraints, to be able to do full statistical analysis on this with um, time in zone and uh, that sort of thing. So it was specifically on the end result and moving backwards. But um, to, to start us off, to evaluate who we had when we're looking ahead for recruiting purposes, and even the day-to-day -day in establishing what we're doing in practice, how we're approaching the game, getting us to this point now, starting the third year, to really change and hone in on who we are at Portland and what our game objectives are and use that for our practice and our, um, our recruiting purposes. Most everything we do, we put a statistical analysis on uh, that. Specifically, we started with our, our scoring for and against and has evolved uh, specifically into our entries for for and against. And we feel that with our rink in particular, and most of the rinks in the Sumac, in a very small neutral zone, quick transitions, puck possession, were all very important to us, so we measured it. Um, when we started this two years ago, it was 70% controlled entry was uh, deemed successful, and we upped that to 75%. Uh, and it did lead to an increased number of scoring chances off of the entry, and we found that we had um, more second opportunities as well as a result. Uh, now we're really focusing with our new class and four new defensemen in the lineup on applying that same sort of pressure and denying our defensive team and really trying to make that a focus for us so that for each individual, we'll measure how successful they are um, and 
add that to their pairing and try to figure out who's doing what uh, in that depth mode. Because I feel like defensemen are are not able to be uh, statistically analyzed as well as an offensive uh, forward or a defenseman. And for our game, that's, that's something that we need to do a much better job of is stopping the other team from getting scoring chances. So rather than just worrying about what's happening when they have the puck in, uh, in our zone and we're blocking a shot or if we're deflecting a pass, uh, we're taking that as a step further. And it certainly has helped us on the offensive side. So thank you for pointing in on the defensive side. It's going to make a big difference. We have a bunch of limitations with our manpower and what kind of video uh, analysis we can do, but that's become a priority for us. And we're expecting to see that influence how we coach, certainly how we recruit, and uh, even our day to day and how we establish practice. All right. Um, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Matt, for. Uh doing this for hosting hosting this i think it's year two and we've grown from year one uh thanks for having having me um i love analytics i love uh the statistical part of it i love the analytical part of it uh it comes with some challenges uh the first challenge i guess if i could try and paint a picture about what it's like for me the hockey coach uh, to come down those stairs um i, I hate math i've always hated math and the, the picture that I see is all of these numbers and equations coming out of each and every one of your brains, and it, and it sort of filled this room, and it's a, like a fog and a mud pit that I gotta walk through to get down here so that I can try and make what you guys are passionate about relevant to how we coach. So with that as an opening, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really hard. Uh, we, we, I think a lot of us are traditionalists in, in hockey. We have, we have six to nine people on our staff at Canisius um, that are evaluating um, statistics, video, and creating analytics from it. Uh, I feel like my job is to break those down into, into two areas. Areas that as coaches we can understand and use to apply to our game plan. And then from that, areas that we want to present to our players that are relevant to them. Keeping in mind the classes they go to, the systems they're trying to learn, uh, the, the mental and, and physical health of them so that they are not playing to a number. Okay, it's dangerous in my opinion, that any of our players are playing to a number, that if they go on the ice and Corsi is important to them and they shoot a puck every time they touch it, then I think your statistical, um, it, 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 it screws things up, right? Uh, I think the statistics of Andrew Kane, I saw his name up there, I know he leads the league in shots. Uh, we practice give and goes, I think Evander practices give and gones. You can't shoot every time you get. Some of the things that we measure important for our team are, are Corsi. I got my poor guys here. What else do we do? We got Corsi. Um, that's an important one. Entries and exits. We don't share with the team. Um, we, we use those for our purposes to potentially line matchups. Um, Joe mentioned it's, it's hard to measure defensemen. We, one year, about four years ago, uh, Sean Roach, who's now with the New York Rangers, was our video guy, analyst, uh, analytics guy. I wanted to keep track of, from a scouting perspective, recruiting perspective, and coaching perspective, we always talk about the first pass for a defenseman. Well, there's the first pass, that's how the idea started. Um, then we realized that the first pass happens in the D zone, but a first pass can happen in the neutral zone and a first pass can actually happen in the offensive zone. So then it got a little bit bigger. Then we realized that sometimes it's not a pass, it's a, it's a, it's a touch. So we measured every defenseman's, every touch that every defenseman had in a game for the entire season. It was either good or bad. 
<laughs> it was so the defensive zone, you know, a pass, a deflection, a poke check was the result, good or bad. Neutral zone, same thing. We did add in the offensive zone a shot because it could be a shot pass, it could be um, a shot wide off the end boards, and, and we needed to have some opportunity to, to say this was good or this was bad. We then compared it to two defensemen of the Chicago Blackhawks, two defensemen on the uh, Boston Bruins. What was the takeaway from all of it? We had over 13,000 touches measured in a season. Our, and, and I'm thinking about the slide who's up there uh, before us. Our best defenseman had the highest percentage. Our worst defenseman had the lowest percentage of effectiveness. Our most physical defenseman, he was average, but he won more puck battles. Uh, the NHL defenseman touched the puck twice as much, and we shared that with our guys. They move it quicker, and they move it more effectively because they're passing it to open men. So if I accumulate all of the hours for 13,000 touches, counting those, I learned something I was pretty sure of already, but it validated it. And as we go through analytics, I feel my charge is to challenge these guys. Give me analytics that will validate the way we are playing and I can use as a statistical comparison, one player against another or one system against another. Uh, I would like to challenge the group to come up with some sort of metric that really, really measures goaltenders from my perspective. Thanks. I think we're all waiting on that goaltending one day. Good morning. My name's Ed Gozik. I've been the coach of Oswego State as a head coach for the past 14 seasons. Previous to that, I was the assistant coach there for 13 seasons. In those 13 seasons, when I first started, our video consisted of two uh, VCRs popping the tape in and out uh, after uh, one of our students called the hand camera, to now where we're upgrading to X's and O's uh, so that we can do a better job with the video so that we can get the statistics from that. We have uh, a grad assistant, a full-time assistant, we have a gentleman that volunteers his time that does the majority of our video breakdown, starting with the video so that we can get the statistics or different numbers to help us improve. Um, who, First of all, I'd say we, so you have an idea of how we use uh, statistics to first of all help us formulate who should be in the lineup and improve each player throughout the course of the season. We roughly have 125 practices throughout the course of the season and we play 25 games. So we have the opportunity to look at our players or have an influence on them on the ice roughly 150 times. We videotape practice, and we use that as a means to try to help help the players, but also to evaluate who should be playing on the weekend. The statistic part with this, I have some awesome people here presenting that I'm trying to learn from you. Uh, the one thing that always comes into my mind, though, when dealing with these things is the, the human side. Whether it's recruiting or whether it's your own team, of the players that have passion, the attitude, and the effort, uh, forget the statistics. So I don't know what you can come up with on a way to measure that. At our level at Division Three, at Dave's, he has scholarships, and when he makes a mistake with a scholarship, nobody likes to run a kid out of a program to bring someone else that can come in that has the ability to play. Our issue, I think, all at the Division Three level, we don't have scholarships. We don't have something to offer like the Division One program, so we have to, I would say, over-recruit to cover our mistakes. But where am I going with this is some method that we evaluate, we take, that's the hard part, Division Three, getting the next best kid after they're done taking the players that any of you, if you go to a rink, kid that stands out, it's pretty easy. Try to pick the next best kid that's not going to get a scholarship to come to your school. Does he have 
the execution part, the skill part, but just as importantly, how are you gonna measure the attitude and the effort and the passion, which takes time to develop, it doesn't just happen when they just step on your campus, creating that culture. When we make mistakes and we use the video to correct the on ice things, many of the times, the things that are the difference makers is everybody, when you get to the end of the year, trying to win a national championship as talented players, they're all well coached. They've all used your statistics to help them get there. But the team that has the character and the passion and those other things that I discussed, which you come up with a way to measure so that we don't make the mistakes uh, on those areas, um, that would be unbelievable. And looking at the statistics that you had up there earlier, you can twist those things around so many times because many times, you know, zone entry or goaltending or PK clears, coaches give players certain roles. And, uh, you know, PK clears, for example, who was talking about that? How many times were they off the glass? How many times were they straight down the ice? How many times were they one-on-one -on -one battles? How many times were they second chance opportunities? I know statistics for us are PK, our power play, and we 85% of our goals came off the second chance uh, opportunities. They weren't the original shot on net. We weren't beating goalies clean. So getting pucks into those areas so that we could create a second chance opportunity. But through practice and through the games, uh, we tried to compare ourselves to um, the statistics that Ron Ralston came up with, a former Sabres coach two years ago in Philadelphia at the NHL draft at the coach's workshop of where, what zone, uh, where did the buck start off of a turnover every seven seconds on an average, our, that's what makes our sport great, there's a change of possession. So unlike baseball or basketball or even football where you're set on offense or defense in hockey every seven seconds, there's a change. And so how do you adapt to that offense and defense? His statistics proved out that within three seconds of a turnover in the offensive zone, the majority of goals were scored in the playoffs two years ago. Within five seconds in the neutral zone, off of a turnover, the majority of goals were scored from that zone on the ice. And a little over seven seconds in the defensive zone, it took that. So the point about quick counterattack that uh, Joe brought up, I think is a valid one. We wanted to see if that statistic held true at our level. Um, and in two of the zones it did, in the defensive zone, it took us a much longer period of time um, off when we broke down all our goals that we could score. The other one was where does the first pass go after a turnover? So if you watch the playoffs this past year, I just got done putting a presentation together for next weekend down in New York. But when I broke down uh, the championship final game, uh, series, uh, it was interesting. Because I'm looking for neutral zone transition plays in San Jose, very good. Almost every time they were awesome. There was some type of rhyme or reason to how they attacked and counterattacked through the neutral zone. Pittsburgh, who ended up winning it, there was no rhyme or reason. It was getting pucks and getting them in deep and putting pressure on San Jose's deep. And I don't know what I was watching when I watched it late spring, but I didn't pick up on it until I went back through and watched all the games a second time. And their D got it. They were not even, there was, it was not a puck possession game, which we've been preaching. Pittsburgh did not play a hold on to a game. They got pucks in deep, they got after it, and pressured the hell out of San Jose's deep. They laid pucks to area and created foot races. They got the puck out of their own zone. Quite frankly, everything that we have been going against, we want to come out with control and with numbers. They did it. They just got the puck out of the zone and then forechecked the neutral zone and again, the mentality of putting the pressure on San Jose. So we took, we take that, use it with our players, and then we try to justify how we want to play with the talent level that we have. So those are some of the ways in which we use statistics to try to maintain a consistent approach year in and year out. 
from what I'm learning from you, it makes us sharpen our pencil, as Dave said, to justify why we're doing something or else we better change and use your statistics to become better and stay, stay out of the curve. Uh, Mitch Stevens, I'm from assistant coach at Geneseo, going into my fourth year. I think the biggest challenge for me is that we have a staff of basically three, and I'm the only one looking at keeping track of any stats or doing anything like that. So they compared to like David Kanishas when he has a staff, it's somewhat limited to uh, what we can track. So started off when I first got there, rather than looking at stuff like things like plus minus where there's maybe uh, at our level, 25 games, there's 80 to 100 goals scored, trying to at least move that to tracking scoring chances. Just get a larger sample size, try to get a better better feel for how our team played each game, doing that for each player, seeing what, how they impacted the, our team offensively, defensively, just trying to keep that sample size as big as possible. Um, then trying to move, on, couldn't, with a limited staff, it's hard to do it for a team, but trying to keep track of Corsi for, as a team as a whole, just to get an idea of how we played in certain games and over stretches in the season, things like that. Um, so it's, it's been a challenge that way definitely for us. I mean, I'm a, definitely interested in stats, but trying to apply it can sometimes be a challenge. Um, I think that it's definitely, the most useful part of it for me is just kind of eliminating any bias that we might have as coaching staff. With looking at stats and seeing a guy that we thought was further down our depth chart and the stats are kind of showing that he's one of our better players, kind of reassessing where that guy should fit in our team. Like, do we kind of judge someone too early and they're proven they were wrong? Or like, just kind of starting conversations is kind of the biggest thing I've found for stats, the biggest use. Not taking them as an absolute, saying this guy has the he's creating the most scoring chances for the game, so he's definitely our best player. But at least looking and seeing if someone's up near the top of our team and trying to figure out why that is. Like if I someone I thought wasn't as as high up and they're do, showing up really well in uh, some more of the advanced stats, and kind of trying to figure out why that is and if it's something we should be paying more attention to, or if I, I mean, if there's some sort of cognitive bias bias that I've had against them that I'm not aware of. I think that's probably been the biggest benefit to me of trying to keep more and more stats like that. I think like uh, someone else said, trying to find a way to evaluate defensemen is the biggest part. There's always been the basic stats that you can look at a forward and see who's scored a lot, who's creating scoring chances like that, but trying to figure out what, what defensemen are the most effective. I think the biggest challenge with that is knowing who your defensemen are playing against. Whether my, I have my, like my top defenseman defensively, I try and play him against other teams' best forwards every game. So I mean, he's gonna spend a lot more time in his own end than if he was playing against an average opponent. I think that's the, the challenge is knowing, looking at the stats and trying to know who they were on the ice with, for and against. And I mean, it would be great to be able to track that at our level, but I think that that's a really important part, not just looking at the, the raw number without any context. Yeah, and that's a, a good lead in. A number of you mentioned roles given to players. So what are some of the things maybe you either collect now with your staff or how do you go about when you're filling out your lineup card and you know each player's role in your system? What are data points you might use to help you arrive at those decisions? And we'll you know, just kind of fire through these with each of you guys. Well, I, I know um, we've adjusted a little bit this year in that we want to have our top line, uh, and we're going we're gonna to use Corsi and modified plus minus. So our modified plus minus is who's creating offense for us and who's creating offense for them. Uh, one of my assistants, Trevor Large, came from West Point, and through his research and homework with some analytic people, uh, modified plus minus is measured. Uh, if you create the scoring chance, you get a plus five. If uh, you're the, the next guy, you get a plus three, but everybody else on the ice gets a plus one. Um, so if I go through the whole team and pass it to Ed and Eddie shoots it in the net, I get plus five, he gets plus three, and these guys would each get plus one. 
Same thing on the defensive side, trying to measure that. So our top line, we want to have a positive Corsi and a positive modified plus minus. Our next two lines, we would like to be productive offensively. So a little bit uh, harder to measure, deeper. I, I want them to outscore who they're playing against. That's a, a more general. And then my my uh, hard line that we call it, they need to be even or better in the core seat and out hit the opponent when they're on the ice. So that's the rules that we've given for our, our four lines. I may mention before, um, you uh, put our value on every potential scoring chance. And we, we report it a little bit differently. If uh, you score a goal, it's a plus three. If uh, you set up that goal, it, you create a great a scoring chance, it's a plus two. Um, the legitimate shot on that is a plus one. If you shoot wide, uh, it's a zero. And if you get your shot blocked, uh, you start the other team's breakout, uh, the other team gets control of that puck, it's, it's a minus one. So for our top line, we want our guys to be at least even, uh, preferably on, on the plus side. It goes more into who we set up for our, our power play units um, because we need effective goal scorers. So we want guys, when they get that chance, they're not starting the other team's breakout, but they're getting great A scoring chances. So it's, um, it's a very rudimentary system that we use, but it was effective for us in our developing stages to find out who's our most effective goal scorers who are the guys who are making the most opportunity out of each chance. All right, um, this is the way we used it this, this past year. Um, um, our top four defensemen really didn't change much all year, but our five and six did. And the information we got from Ryan and Matt were who was playing with who? And who had more opportunities? Or who had less opportunities against? So when he gave us the samples of the different pairings that we had as our, our five, six defensemen, or one of our, you know, our pairings there, um, you know, we, we changed our mind on, on who we were putting out there simply because we were experimenting for the first maybe 10 or 12 games. You know, when he came back and said, here, these two guys are, eliminating a lot of chances against. When these two guys are together, there's more chances against. And as your five, six defensemen, you really kind of want to be even. Uh, you certainly don't want them, you, you want to have confidence to put them on the ice that they're not going to get scored against. Um, you're not looking for a ton of offense out of them. You're just looking just to come out even. Forwards wise, this is where we became a little bit non-traditional. Um, Mitch had stated earlier, he wants to put his defensive defensemen out against the team's top line. What we started thinking was, well, if we play a team, let's say like Bentley, who was very, had one really good line, and they were really good, all right? So instead of saying, hey, we're gonna put our third line out against them, our checking line, and just shut them down. Well, your third line is not gonna be as good as someone else's first line. They're gonna be very skilled, very fast, and very good. So we decided, through numbers from Matt Ryan, that instead of doing that, which would be more of a tra traditionalist way, we put up, if we could, we put our top line against their top line and made their top line play defense against our top line. And took away their puck possession and took away their opportunities and let them be more concerned about our top guys. Now, if you're an offensive guy, if you play hockey, you're an offensive guy, you want the puck and you want to score goals. But if you're not able to do that, we might take a team like Bentley, even though they beat us, <laughs> but we might take them out of their game plan and say, okay, top line versus top line. I feel good about that. We'll, we'll take our chances with our second, third, and fourth line against their second, third, and fourth line. Um, so that's where the numbers for us made a huge difference in our decision-making and game strategy. We're identifying the roles for the players. Um, every guy can't be 
in a perfect world, you got four lines that can all go and you don't worry one through four. Uh, do you have the talent level to do that so that the fourth line isn't relegated to five or six minutes of ice and don't get scored against and out hit them and get pucks in deep and eat minutes up philosophy as a coach versus we got four lines, we're gonna roll four lines. Uh, we're all gonna get pretty much equal ice other than special teams and uh, identifying those roles based upon what we know. We don't use a traditional plus minus, we use grade A chances uh, while you're on the ice and grade A chances against you while you're on the ice. It, has, it doesn't have to necessarily go in the net. What we found is many times the statistics for plus minus were misleading because a D just changes even though he was just out there for 30, 40 seconds, he creates a turnover to get us going up the ice and he comes to the bench, another guy hops on and he's credited with a plus when we're scoring the goal and he did none of the work. So we change, we use that statistic a little bit more than a true plus minus as far as our players. Our best player on our team on any given night that's first power play group and plays a lot of minutes averages three to five shots a game. Our best player is going to have five opportunities, three to five opportunities in a game to score a goal. So the percentage of those five that go in um, our leading point guys, it is huge that they bear down and are hitting the net. And as we say to them, are you shooting to score? Are you shooting to create a second chance opportunity? I said the earlier, 85% of our power play goals came off of rebounds or second chance opportunities. I talked to one friend that plays in the NHL and I asked him what their team did because they were one of the best power plays this past year. It was never once did the coach discuss the first shot to score. I mean, it happens, but it was all about creating second chance opportunities. You have the statistics, 85% of the goals are scored within a stick length of the crease. So there's a reason teams defend and pack it in into the home plate area, the house, whatever you want to call it. And how are you going to create create that offense and create the roles for your players. Middle lane drive, outnumbering him at the net. D, finding a seam to get pucks through. You know, all those types of statistics we keep to identify the players' roles. When for our D are allowed to join the rush, what time in a game against, what point in your shift, there are so many variables that we put out there for our players so that they understand we want to give them the best chance within their role to be successful. A little different way of looking at it, um, but that helps us determine if we have 8D, four of them, um, are very offensive minded, and do we need all four of them in the lineup as opposed to four that are defensive minded? What is the right mix and what is the right chemistry? If you put two defensive defensemen together, do you put a defensive defenseman with an offensive guy that can go? What is your philosophy gonna be? And again, that comes down to your chemistry of the team and the roles that you identify for them. Yeah, I think when putting the lineup together, I focus a lot on scoring chances, scoring against, especially with forwards, just the scoring chances they're creating and trying to compare when they have different line mates, trying to find what matchups when, compare when two guys are together, are they creating more chances when, than when they play apart? I think last year we had three top forwards that, that was what I focused on was whether splitting them up created more scoring chances for our, our top two lines or not, whether we're leaving them together they uh, created more together. And we eventually found that them being together created a lot more than just two of them being together with a lesser player to create. So I think that was one way that it definitely changed my, or altered the thinking, made, basically made the decision for us. That was the way we wanted to go with our with our top guys. Um, I think the other thing when the ballot, like, same thing, I don't want to make, draw any conclusions straight from that. I know if, when our top line is playing together, they would take almost four times as many face-offs in the offensive zone as they would in the D zone. So 
but offenses on face up, obviously, it's an easy time to throw them out there. So they would create, they had a better probably ratio than they should, they would have if they had just had an even number of zone starts in the offensive and defensive zone. So I think all the stats need to be looked at kind of together. You can't just, I, I sort of just look at one stat and think that that's the be all and end all. I mean, the same thing with, like I was saying, with the defensive defenseman. If I, you're starting him in the D zone a lot, then he's probably going to be giving up more scoring chances than uh, he would otherwise. I think that's the, the biggest thing that uh, we hope. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, maybe during the course of a game or in preparing you know, for an upcoming game, you'll notice you know, a particular way a team plays. And have you maybe talk about specific success you've seen in your shot differentials, your goal differentials, when knowing you're playing a certain style versus another system. Uh, you know, we do have a whiteboard behind us if you guys want to walk us through a specific situation <laughs> you can recall. Um, but just like, you know, because we like to try to see if we can tie in how teams are playing with the data that we can look at. So is there a specific game you recall, you know, you know getting a positive, you know, Corsi, uh, when you change something up or you know, knowing a certain style will be better or worse than and we've played against the past. So. I know it's pretty open-ended, but. I'll go back to the Bentley game. Um, in, or the weekend, you keep laughing, right? Um, but, well, let's, let's go a little anecdotal here. So after that weekend, Ryan and Matt come in, and I wasn't in the room yet to go over the, uh, the stats. But as the goalie coach, let me give you a couple of stats that I, didn't, I really didn't want to go in the room, but we had 103 shots four on the weekend, and we had 46 against, and we lost both games. So, yeah. So, and you, actually, you were asking for me to come in the room, and I wasn't going. But the bottom line is, the, the goaltender is certainly the question mark. Um, and we have our highs and lows with, with goaltending. But in that, when we went back to play Bentley at their rink and we swept them at their rink, uh, we changed the way we played. And the bottom line was they played pack it in style in front of their net. Um, and our, our Corsi numbers, our puck possession numbers, our shots for numbers, they were, they were intergalactic. But we lost both games. You know, so we had to tell our guys, we need to be more selective on shots, be wary, be very concerned about when you're making your changes. Um, the puck possession thing, yeah, that was great. It was, it was great, but what did it turn into? It turned into two, three to two overtime losses at home. Um, yeah, it hurt. So, um, so we changed a little bit about our style the way we played. We, we went to a 2-3, 4 check against them, which kept our third forward extremely high. And basically, you know, they would they would kind of lull you to sleep, let you have the outside, take shots, they block shots, they redirect pucks to the corner, and then they flip one out of their zone, and their, their forwards, that top line they had is gone. Or they worked for a power play, and that top line was their power play, and they were really, really good. Um, so they relied on that. That's the way they played. And we just had to change a couple little things about the way we play to take them out of their strategy, I guess, or their the system, the way they played. Um, but the numbers that Matt and Ryan showed us didn't tell us anything we didn't, we really didn't know per se, with the exception of the shots from the outside. We were, we were settling for poor angle shots, and we were settling for uh, non-quality shots when we had a ton of puck possession. And that really doesn't correlate into much, except for two, three, two overtime losses at home. So uh, we became a little more selective, a little bit more patient against them, but became very wary of what their style was. I, I think this is where the, the marriage between coaching and analytics um, often is, is benefited by simplicity. When we play RIT, they have four great defensemen, we got to pay attention to that. The changes in game are, hey, we're playing shitty, their four defensemen are crushing us, smart enough. And there's no analytic to measure shitty play. <laughs> um, I don't know, that Colorado thing is 
<laughs> um, so I think when we look at the statistics, uh, the, the, the coaches, I think we're pushing analytical people to hey, come up with a simple measurement from a small sample size in a game that's accurate, that's gonna, somebody said, I don't know what the numbers were, but second half prediction or re repeat the second half, I don't know what exactly that meant. But if you could give me a statistic in the first period that after one simple change of, that my human players can make, that I'm gonna win the game, I'll do it every time. But if we, I think if we benefit the most when we, we know who the good players are, the big statistics, goals, assists, shots, um, who's their top line, that's what we pay most attention to. And the advanced analytics come in after the fact, upon review um, of, of a segment. So you know, when we break down games, we break down four RIT games, and we might get some analytics from that, break down four Bentley games. But the truth is we can't make massive changes um, in a period or in a weekend, sometimes not even a month can you make massive changes. So the analytics, we're driving you guys, you guys are driving us. I think we've got to stay simple in that game moment. Just one example would be the pre-scouting of our opponent's power play. We take their last four or five games. We see where their primary shooter is, who's their secondary shooter, who leads them in goals, and where those goals are coming from. And we take that away. That's our first uh, priority as an example of how we would use their statistics to change how we would play in a penalty kill situation. I would agree with Dave that I think all of us are firm believers. We want our teams to have confidence in the way that we play. and We don't want to change a lot unless the scenario like RIT with Bentley. You, you have those scenarios where you, you've got to do something. Sometimes the changes occur uh, for the sake of just shaking it up and getting them refocused. Many times year to year, if you stick with the same systems, even though they're not broken, the complacency sets in, uh, lack of attention to detail sets in. So sometimes we change things, at least at our school, for no other reason than to keep them shut. I think one way that stats kind of changed what we did was two years ago we out we had a 500 year we outshot almost all of our opponents by a wide margin a lot of the time, but we just weren't scoring any goals. And kind of just before we looked at the numbers, basically our thing was all right. Well, this year we need to recruit guys that can score. We're not and we need guys that can put the puck in the net. We need those chances. Like just the simplest way. And then I kind of looked as like I don't. I didn't remember us missing a lot of really great A chances. And so we went back and kind of looked at the numbers deeper and saw that we were getting a lot of shots, but the scoring chances compared to our opponent were fairly similar. So it wasn't that we were missing our chance to score, it was that we weren't creating enough high quality scoring chances. So kind of from that, we concluded that it's not that we need more goal scorers, it's we need more guys that know how to create scoring chances. So I think we went out and tried to recruit, get the smart players, got players of hockey sense that could make plays for other people, set them up in scoring in uh, in high scoring areas. So in the end, I think last year we went from I don't know what it was twelve wins to twenty or something like that, and scored almost probably I think it was half again as many goals as we did the year before. So I think it's something that the numbers kind of backed up and or kind of brought to light, and then it really backed up in the way that things went. It helped us out a lot. I think the big thing for us is that, uh, as was mentioned here, we are who we are. Uh, special teams, we certainly will change, depending upon what uh, the opponent is doing. Um, video is, is a huge part of this for us. I think most of our players now are visual learners, so uh, we have a video board. We literally put the other teams all play up there before we, we work on our, our PK. And I think it's more for us in what we're going to focus on during the week and what we're going to share with our players and us making wholesale changes. <laughs> that just isn't going to happen in the week for us. All right, so I know we got former and current players and coaches out here, so uh, let's open this up to some questions. Well, we got a lot to answer. You know, right over here in America first. Uh, 
All right, I guess this is a blatant plug for the opening panel. I hope you guys are here for it. And um, everybody's saying this, but Dave seemed to be the most vocal. Um, there was actually a back and forth that the panel had beforehand that we didn't go into on how frustrated we get with single number metrics. And the idea that you have one number that tells you about something as opposed to a picture. Um, now granted, hockey is not yet in the same position as say pro baseball or pro basketball and certainly not at the college hockey level. But if you had the opportunity where you could say, be, I don't know, some kind of visualization, tracking the puck, tracking the players on the ice, um, I would love to hear like the one thing each of you would be the most interested in so we get something out of. By the way, no math, just pictures. I like pictures. Um, so, what's the question? What's the single most important stat to me? Not stat, information. This could be really comical or not, but I, when I was listening to that portion, I started thinking about my, my days playing NHL 14, 15 on Sega and stuff like that. And the easiest way to score on that is to make an east-west pass with a one-timer. So I want to know how many chances there are, and this is coming from a goalie guy, uh, for and against that are getting an east-west pass across the Royal Road. So I'd like to see a graph um, on that and the percentages on that. Um, and that would be, you know, for and against. And I know that Ryan is already chuckling over there because I think he's probably already on it. Yeah, I think we gave that to you last year. You did. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, um, I think it was for the end of the year, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, want, I would want to see that on a game-by-game -game basis simply because um, that getting the goaltender to move side to side or getting the goaltender to move, period, um, significantly increases the chance to either score or get a really good second chance opportunity. And and maybe you don't score on the second chance opportunity, but uh, the other team takes a penalty, your team gets their blood flowing a little bit, they get excited about the game, whatever the case may be. Um, I, that's where I think uh, scoring goals and the opportunity to score goals is, it can, I, we would like to see more of it. And it was solidified uh, this past summer. We had Barry Smith who's with the uh, Chicago Blackhawks come in, and he just we showed him a bunch of stuff that we do in our program. And one thing we showed him, we showed him a practice, and we showed him two on ones. So we're doing a drill, two on one drills, and he just stopped and goes, "You guys don't make any passes on two on ones, or not enough passes." So the D can stay in the middle, the goalie can have his feet set, and make a what I consider the second best situation in a game, and the first best is they call it 20 second best is an odd man rush. The second best opportunity in a game, not very good, not a, not a very good opportunity. So my, my answer to you is, east-west passes that come to a, a shot, every game. <laughs> I would say that, I mean, if there was one number you'd want, if there was something equivalent to like war in baseball. Well, that's my point. That matches up. not war. Yeah, that matches up with what a coach sees. I think, like, there's Corsi out there, but you see Corsi where guys will be up at the top, and any, anyone that watches the game knows that they're not pro player. Like, we don't think they're one of the better players on the ice. I think if there's ever, I mean, some cumulative number like that that match with what coaches see. I mean, I, I feel like you, and you look at the war leaders in baseball, and it's guys that most people would agree are the best players. I guess the point that I'm making is not a number. Forget war, forget anything that is a single number, something that is a picture or a movie or something like you were talking about the goalie moving. The goalie moving is not something that you quantify with a single number. It's something that you can maybe show with a graph or a visualization. Um, I'm trying to pull you guys outside the statistics box, which I hope is something you would like to do based on everything you've been saying. So, 
the picture that I like to see um, in, in the dream world is, and maybe it's more, maybe it's not, but um, defined by role, effectiveness combining offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency and use of space and puck management. Bingo, yes. The one that um, I think I touched on what we did with our defensemen is uh, overall puck efficiency is really important to me. And when I think back to my days as a player, that's what kept me in and out of the lineup. And you could call that turnovers, you can call that offense, but it's some combination of offensive efficiency. I'm gonna move on. Other questions? So for uh, NHL level hockey, there's been a lot of investigation into quality of competition. And um, we see uh, over the course of an 82 game season, that it basically washes out, especially the more time on ice the player gets, because you're playing against everybody, right? Um, but we've gotten several quotes from head coaches in the NHL that mention quality of competition when they go into like the playoffs, or for instance, right now when they're doing the World Cup, and these more tournament style, one game done series. Um, with college hockey having obvious disparities in between divisions and things like that, we're going to see greater quality of talent between teams. Do you tend to focus more on matchups during your regular season, or do you also see the same kind of quality of competition not so important during regular season, and really, really important when you get into like playoffs or when you get tournament situations? I think to consistently prepare as we say to our team, you've got to become a national champion final game. That's the ultimate part. When you start to prepare and practice each and every day uh, to be a national champion. If you don't have that attitude at the beginning of the year, so you, you know, the statistics would bear it out that we have to have a goalie that the national 93 save percentage or we're not going to make it to the final four. We know we're going to have to score at least over four goals a game. We're going to have to give up less than two. We're going to have to have the power play. I know these are all individual numbers that she doesn't care for, but the reality <laughs> is we know the power play has got to be at least at 23% at our level. Our penalty kill has got to be at 86%. There's certain numbers that we had our statistics people look at over the last 10 years an NCAA champion, and we know that that's what it's going to take. So we have these numbers out in front of us right now at the beginning of the year. So I think to answer your question, with us with such a short schedule, 25 games compared to 80 in playoffs, is we have to have a playoff approach right from the very first game, no matter whether. The point to you is the big games, from a coaching standpoint, your big rivalry, a team that you know is good or better than you, you don't have to do a hell of a lot to get your team motivated. It's the teams that your players have this perception of that they think that they're better than that scare the hell out of you because they think they could just show up, go through the motions, and get two points. So to prepare consistently, as our goaltender coach says, you know, what is mental training, what is mental preparation, consistently doing things the right way each and every day in practice and each and every game. I think the phrase quality players is misleading. Um, we, we, when we say quality players, good against good is, 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 is high level. Um, if I've got shitty players on my team, I need to hide them, we're not gonna win. Um, and my good players had better be able to capitalize against other teams' poorer players. I understand that's the simple question, but when we're focused only on our team, as Ed said, every matchup is important, but everybody's good. And we, we need to, sometimes the difference isn't what they look like, it isn't the statistics, it's just the confidence. And if I take a fourth line guy off every single time in the beginning of the year against the second or first line, that guy's gonna suck pretty fast. Okay. Sorry, is there another? Just a couple of you guys can answer this that way. We'll keep going. Um, how much of a sample size do you need to see before uh, the numbers influence your thinking or matter to you guys? 
Well, for us, we um, when Matt and Ryan started doing this, we our, our beginning of our season is usually a non-conference game, and our non-conference games are are fairly um, difficult and competitive. You know, so last year was um, you know, we were up at St. Lawrence, Clarkson. We had um, Bowling Green, Boston College, but our numbers were pretty skewed. Um, so when he came, when they first came to to us with the numbers, and, and we were looking at them, we we're like, Ooh, all right, uh, we didn't do very well against those teams, and and the numbers certainly supported that. But we just weren't good enough at the time. And then uh, when you get into our, when we got into our league play and our league stats, that's when we started to see consistency, or at least something, some kind of a trend, um, and something that we thought was valid. Um, so I would say, what we did, 10 games, I think, where we're at, something like that. Every 10, every 10 games, so, um, so for us it was 10 games told us a lot. Um, and we only put, you know, our, our 34 game season, um, 10 games is, it would be pretty good. Uh, NHL 80 games. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't think they're going to change much after numbers aren't going to change that much after the first half of the season. I don't, I don't think that they would. Um, but for us, the 10 games and our first 10 night hockey league games told us a lot of what we were, who we were putting on the ice and who we were putting on the ice against. At the Division Three level, we only get 25 games. We will measure on a weekend. That's not really fair. We understand that the way that our schedule works out in the calendar. We're five to six game increments. Um, there's usually a break in there, and it's, uh, it's Ed mentioned, it's about having our guys prepare and focus when we get 25 games. So each one of them is a game seven of Stanley Cup for us. And that's the way that it we reinforced. All right, I had to ask this idea, so two more people, so if you want to answer that. Yeah, I'd just like to answer that, and, and we're, as coaches every day, we're hamsters on a treadmill. How much numbers do you need to convince me? So it doesn't really matter. If I'm not challenging you like, hey, show me that this makes a difference, you can guarantee that in one instance, I'll take it, but you get better convinced. Hi, I just had a question about um, the kind of style of play, and I'm thinking specifically now for people on kind of a long-term view. So one of the kind of advances of, of analytics and hockey, broadly speaking, is that We've come to understand the importance of things like controlled entries a little bit more. Um, and I think a specific tactical way you can see that in the way that games play the NHL is teams are willing to make passes in their own defensive end into the slot for the purpose of breaking out. It used to be verboten that you had to throw it out to the boards on the strong side. That's how you broke out. And I'm not saying analytics created that, but it's kind of helped us understand the importance of that a little bit better. And so in the NHL, the game has changed a little bit in the last 10 years. Um, you know, carrying it in is more important, exiting with control is more important, um, there's less an emphasis on chip and chase. Is that something that you guys see translating to NCAA hockey? Is that kind of a trickle down thing? I mean, I know there's a tendency to imitate the NHL. And then kind of more on that, how when you see these numbers, you don't want to coach towards a number, but you coach towards a kind of style of play that you think will kind of generate the outcomes that you desire. I think when you remember the lockout uh, when they took the red line away, um, the initial discussion was it'll be the, the Russian five uh, attempt to enter when you can't enter, circle back, fly around, do it again. I think some teams tried that. The evolution now is carry it in when you can, chip it in when you can't, and go get it, have an organized plan. Um, for me, uh, style of play is more dictated by the individual in a certain moment than it is by an over, uh, overwhelming philosophy that I might give a, a guy. Example, one of my guys isn't a good stick handler, can't carry the puck wide and then possess it, dump it in and go hand somebody. I think the point on uh, the NHL having an influence is, is valid, especially with our recruiting. And being a puck possession team that interests those guys that aren't quite at Division One capable level to consider Portland and the style that we play. So you know, it does have a, a huge impact on our program and who we're able to recruit. 
critics. Maybe I have one more quick question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get a quick feeling. So, you know, when you're taking these statistics, I guess how are you collecting your data? Are people just watching videos or watching the game and just counting up statistics as they go, like manually? We also upgraded to Axos um, because I mentioned before that most of our players now are visual learners and in our bi-weekly meetings we want to have video to show them. So we have the stats that correlate with the video that makes a big impact for them. So um, we code our games live and then we go back in after and add the, the secondary data which again has the, the benefit of correlating directly with the video. Yeah, I think that's the same thing, just watching the video and counting them up. But pretty much as simple as done forever. All right. Uh, big round of applause for you guys. <laughs> All right. It's always good to get another perspective on a lot of this. Uh, it's a lot of it, you know, goes, goes together real well. So uh, now we have pizza. We have posters. Yeah, I think we could just get. We, I want to. There's, there's three posters out there. Um, I think I guess, uh, what, uh, Colby, Connor, and John? I, I think, did you, you guys are here, could you stand up quickly? Just so that people can look around. So if you go out, if you're in the atrium, um, there are, with the pizza, you'll see three posters. If you guys would, could, could be for some of the less here in your posters to answer your questions, and those of you just saw. Who is standing up? Uh, if you have questions about what back there, uh, search them out. Well, and also, uh, Rob Tufts wanted me to make an announcement. He has some old copies of uh, Rob Bowman's Hockey Abstract that he's uh, got out there if you're interested in purchasing them. So, uh, Rob, just give a wave. He's open in the corner. Uh, if you're interested in getting one of those, go see Rob. Oh, we'll be back at 1.30. <laughs> <laughs>